All right, so diving right in um, into the question. The first one is, humans share large percent of their DNA with many other animal species. What does this mean? Is this in any way evidence for evolution? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And uh, I can see why it got all kinds of votes. <laughs> uh, because, you know, and, and the short answer is yes. For somebody who views life from an evolutionary perspective, the, the shared biological features that we see among organisms, particularly organisms that naturally group together, whether it's anatomical and physiological features or whether it's features at the genetic level, is taken as evidence for common descent. But, you know, the, the, the point I would, would make is that that particular view is, again, looking at through the lens um, of the evolutionary paradigm, of a, of a kind of an evolutionary worldview. Uh, and, you know, when it comes to the way science functions today, science operates um, in a framework that's dictated by methodological naturalism. And what, what that means is that when you engage in science, you can only posit natural process mechanistic explanations for the universe or phenomena in the universe, including the origin and the history of life. So because of that constraint, the only viable option to explain the origin and the history of life is some type of evolutionary process where mechanism is generating life. And, and so when you adopt that framework, then the only way to understand those shared features is that it, again, provides compelling evidence for evolution. I've heard many people say, in light of these shared features, the only thing that makes sense is an evolutionary history of life. But for somebody who holds to a Christian worldview, I recognize that there, there is a creator, and that creator has, I believe, intervened in the origin and the history of life. And, and that means that it's possible for me to posit an alternative explanation to those shared features that reflect design or reflect teleology and purpose. And it's interesting to note that prior to Darwin, biology was, was really design-oriented. It was a teleological enterprise where people saw God at work in biological systems, as P Paley argued in the design of systems. But there were other people like Sir Richard Owen who saw uh, shared features in biology as reflecting an archetypical design that existed in the mind of a creator and that was then functionally manifested in the created order. And he saw that as the ultimate expression of design. And so what Darwin does is he comes along and he evolutionizes Owen's idea of an archetype, replacing it with a common ancestor. And so I, I would argue that if you relax the requirements of methodological naturalism, and if you um, uh, are open to a creator intervening in life's history, then you could see those shared features as reflecting shared design just in the way, same way that Sir Richard Owen saw it. It doesn't demand uh, an evolutionary explanation. What, why so many people, again, would argue that this is unequivocal evidence for evolution has to do with the philosophical constraints imposed on science more so than the evidence itself. But this is probably a good place to, to really bring up a quick point, and that is there are uh, Christians who believe that God utilized evolution as a means by which to bring about his creative purposes. I am, a, 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 am an old earth creationist uh, uh, and would probably share a lot of agreement with my brothers and sisters who are young earth creationists in that I believe God in, intervened in the history of life to bring about his creative purposes. And I see scientific evidence that supports that idea. But there are brothers and sisters I have who think that God utilized evolution as a means to create, and they would point to this kind of evidence as, as reason for that. So the point here is that really our faith as Christians and our, our, uh, our worldview as Christians doesn't hinge on whether or not evolution is true or not. Uh, but really, I think it, it hinges on the question of you know, did, did Jesus truly rise from the dead? And so that's going to be, you know, tomorrow's presentation, you know, uh, but the, the, the larger point is that as a Christian, there's a number of different approaches I can take to the scientific record that I believe uh, are compatible with our, with the broadly speaking, with the Christian worldview. 
Right. And that is actually a perfect segue into the next question. The question is, what is your response to theistic evolution? Yeah. Well, you know, as, as I mentioned, I don't hold to that particular view, uh, but I do know a number of people who are deeply de devoted to their faith as Christians, who uh, I could easily share fellowship with, who would disagree with my views on you know, evolution. Again, I, and I, I don't necessarily reject evolution outright, but rather certain facets of the evolutionary paradigm. I think there's some aspects of evolution that are well established. There's other aspects in my mind that are not. I don't think we can explain the origin of life through chemical evolution. There are certain transitions in life's history that currently don't have good explanations from an evolutionary perspective. The Cambrian explosion would be one example of that. There's other examples as well. So I, I am skeptical that evolution can explain everything in biology, but I think it can explain some features of biological systems. So I'm, I'm not an anti-evolutionist, but I'm, I'm, I'm an, a skeptic of, of certain aspects of the paradigm uh, uh, for scientific reasons. I also have some um, theological and philosophical concerns with theistic evolution, uh, primarily if you embrace the idea of God using evolution to create, that means humanity must have evolved. And I have a hard time squaring the notion of human evolution with uh, the human origins accounts that I read uh, in scripture, particularly the historicity of, of Adam and Eve. And I know there's a number of theistic evolutionists that are working on ways to, to, to have a historical Adam and Eve while having humanity evolve. I'm not con convinced yet by that work that they've done. So uh, I have scientific, theological, and philosophical concerns that, that keep me from embracing that position. Right, right. And the next question is concerning the, the uh, age of the earth. The question is, by biblical chronology, Adam and Eve created around 6,000 years ago. What are your views on that? And do you think that that number is about right? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, I, I'm an old earth creationist, and I'm actually persuaded by the arguments of people like Walt Kaiser and Gleason Archer that the best way to understand Yom is not 24 hours, but again, a period of time. And that's uh, partly what I presented was, again, that biblical argument for why Yom, I think, is a period of time. There's other uh, biblical reasons, I think, as well for understanding Yom as a period of time. For example, there's a number of direct statements that we see in the Old Testament for the antiquity of the earth and the antiquity of features on the earth as well that seem to imply an ancient uh, earth and, and life being ancient on the earth as well. Uh, so I think there's good biblical reasons to think that's the case. And so I don't see anything that then demands in the text that the, the universe or the earth or humanity are 6,000 years old. Uh, in fact, I think the text is silent on that. Now, where people get that 6,000 year number is from the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, where they are trying to tabulate uh, when Adam and Eve would have been created based on the age of the patriarchs and then the, the age they were when their sons were born. You know, the, the genealogies in Genesis 5 go from Adam to Noah, and then Genesis 11 from Noah to Abraham. And it, and kind of long story short, I'm not going to get into the details so we can get to as many questions as possible, but long story short, those genealogies are not meant to be timekeeping constructs. They are theological constructs, and to read them in, in that way, where you're using them to tabulate the age of Adam and Eve is actually not a legitimate way to, to read them. Uh, there's a, a great uh, book that I would recommend uh, called On the Reliability of the Old Testament by Kenneth Kitchen, an Old Testament scholar that has a great discussion of how to properly read the genealogies. But also we, we summarize that in our book, uh, Who Was Adam, uh, if you, you're interested. Also uh, on our website at reasons.org, there are a series of articles written by uh, uh, two scholars, um, Hugh Henry and Dan Dyke. Dan Dyke is an Old Testament scholar that explained why the, the genealogies should not be read in the way that young earth creationists uh, tend to read them. So anyway, those are some places you can go to, to get more information. Yes, that's that's very much helpful. Uh, 
we'll be dropping the link to the reasons.org website in the chat um so the next question is a two part question the first part is does bearing the image of god have any biological implications and uh, i think once you answer that we'll move into the second part yes i you know i uh, actually in in my book uh, who was adam as well as in a book that i wrote called humans 2.0 we make a case that you a uh, scientific case that human beings actually do bear god's image and you know when it comes to the image of god there's disagreement among theologians as to what the image of god actually constitutes uh, some would say that the image of god is a set of attributes that human beings uniquely possess that uh, resemble in in an imperfect in a limited way the attributes of the creator uh that would be the view that i would hold that's the resemblance view others would argue that the image of god refers to uh, our relationship with god that's the relational view others re- uh it is it refers to the um the 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 role that we would play that is that we are to be caretakers of the planets that we are to to subdue the earth and bring it under our control that's the representative view that we have a we were god's representatives here on earth and these three views are not mutually incompatible I, in fact i would argue that the resemblance view essentially subsumes the relationship view and the representative view but if you adopt the resemblance view where these are certain attributes what's remarkable to me is that uh, anthropologists many of them who are not friendly to the christian world view who are viewing human origins in evolutionary terms have have concluded that human beings are actually exceptional that we stand apart from all other creatures that exist today and that have ever existed including neanderthals and they argue that what separates us is symbolism that human beings uniquely possess the capacity to represent the world symbolically and then to to communicate that the, that symbolism with one another and and i think that symbolism it connects to many of the attributes that we would consider to be part of the resemblance view of god and and what's interesting is our capacity for symbolism shows up explosively out of nowhere when human beings first appear on the earth uh so it's not only unique to humanity but it shows up suddenly as if it was a creation event and nobody can explain how our symbolic capacities could have emerged from animal communication to open ended human language is a huge chasm that nobody can explain uh from an evolutionary perspective though tried as they might so i see the image of god as actually a defendable a scientific uh prospect that i think does reflect unique characters a characteristics that we have as human beings right and the and the second part asks with the development of cisper c i s p r maybe you will get that i have no idea what that is with the development of cisper and other gene editing tools some day geneticists may edit our genes in various ways so how should the church respond to gene editing yeah okay that's a great part 2 question uh and in what's being referred to is is crispr gene editing technology and and uh, again as a way to give you some additional resources in my book humans uh, 2.0 i have a, a whole chapter devoted to to crispr gene editing how it works um uh, from a biotechnology standpoint and then the remainder of the book is essentially talking about what should the christian response to gene editing be and kind of in a nutshell th- this gene editing technique which is still far from from workable it it's still a ways off from having any kind of clinical utility there's a number of technical issues that need to be resolved with it um but it does hold the potential to be a, a very powerful biomedical tool that could actually treat countless number of gene- that numbers of genetic disorders there's somewhere around close to 10,000 genetic disorders that involve mutations in a single region of the genome and if you could go in there and re- and re- correct that error you could literally provide therapies if not maybe even cures for thousands and thousands of genetic disorders many of them which are rare that have no therapies or treatments whatsoever so this is a very exciting use that i think is consistent with the christian view that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and so that's a very high and noble purpose and there's a there some but there are issues with that because that same gene editing technique could be used to create designer babies to create human beings with enhanced biological properties that begin to 
erode or undermine our identity as human beings. So my view is that as Christians, we should advocate for its biomedical use, but we should be a voice of caution for using the technology for human enhancements. And what's happening is that many people actually see this kind of technology as a gateway to salvation. This is a movement known as transhumanism, where they argue that we should use science and technology to not only correct our biological flaws, but to modify our bodies in such a way to give our, ourselves practical immortality. And with advances like this, there's a number of people that are now looking at science and technology really as the mode of salvation. And so this is something that we also need to be aware of as Christians and need to be able to articulate uh, the gospel in, in the context of people searching for salvation and turning to science and technology as opposed to the gospel. And while that sounds a bit ominous, I actually think that's a good thing because what it means is that people are seeking salvation and they're going to science and technology to do that. So their, their desire for salvation is there. They're, what's misplaced is where they're trying to find that salvation. But with transhumanism, it now opens up the possibility to present the gospel in a natural, seamless way uh, where we can show that science and technology can never save us truly. That they're wonderful things that can improve the quality of our life, but science and technology can never save us. It's only the person of Christ. But, but what a great opportunity to enter into meaningful spiritual conversations with people who desire salvation, who see death as unnatural, who want to bring an end of, to pain and suffering, who desire utopia. Science and technology can't give us those things. The gospel can. Wow. Well, wow, excellent. Okay, the next question is, a, I think it's going to be a fan favorite. Um, what about alien life? If there is alien life, will it affect the argument that life on Earth is fine-tuned? Yeah, well, um, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a really, really great question. And uh, there's a, a, a great book that I uh, would love for you guys to, to be aware of. And it's a book called, Is There Life Out There? And it's a book written by my friend and colleague at Reasons to Believe, Uh, Jeff Zwierink, who's an astrophysicist, where he takes on those kinds of questions. And, you know, when it comes to the existence of alien life, uh, if there was alien life out there, uh, uh, you could make the argument that it could undermine the, at least the fine-tuning argument with respect to the rare earth argument. It didn't wouldn't necessarily undermine the fine-tuning argument with respect to the anthropic principle or the design of the universe itself. But if we begin to examine the circumstances of, you know, that particular planet where that alien life is discovered uh, and the circumstances around the, the origin and the history of life on that planet, we very may well discover that it looks as if the, the, that planet, too, has the signature, signature features of being designed, right? Or it could be that the origin of life appears to be just as mis- miraculous on that planet as it does on Earth. And so that then gives us a second piece of evidence in favor of the design argument. So it doesn't necessarily rule out the design argument, though it could, it could possibly do that with regard to, again, the rare Earth idea. It just depends on the circumstances surrounding it. But even if, if there is alien life that is discovered in our solar system or beyond, Uh, and by the way, if there's alien life that we discover, let's say on Mars, that you can't rule out the possibility that that alien life actually is from Earth that was then transported to Mars due to the impact events hitting the Earth, where the ejecta from the impact events could then travel to the moon or to other planetary systems in our solar system, other planets, I'm sorry, in our solar system. So there's, there's, you know, there's could be other explanations for discovering life on those planets other than it originated there. But if you think about the idea that God is defined as a creator, right, that, that is part of his attributes. And in fact, part of our manifestation of the image of God is that we are creators as well. So when we create artistic, uh, it, when we engage in artistic creations, music and artwork, or when we create through technology, This is a manifestation of the image of God. We are many creators just like our creator. But given that, that, that our creator 
does create, or you and you read in Genesis one how God appears to be this artist who is deeply satisfied with that which he creates, where he steps back and he says, after each day of creation, it is good. Uh, why wouldn't that? Why would that God limit his work as creator to our planet? Why wouldn't he not? Why would he not create throughout the universe? Right. So I would expect actually life to be abundant in the universe because of it's, it reflects God's nature. But I think, again, if we discover that life, we're going to see that it looks like it's the product of a creation event, not the product of, uh, of an evolutionary history. Right. And uh, just, just to point out, when Fuzz says that uh, there could be alien life that have been transported to Mars, he's not talking about fully grown Martians who jumped off an, alien, an ancient trampoline and landed on Mars. He's talking about micro, uh, microbiological cells of uh, something in the microscopic level on, on planet Mars. And the next question concerns yeah, dinosaurs. Yeah, what are you Thanks viewing? for clarifying that. <laughs> the next question is on dinosaurs. What are your views on dinosaurs? It looks like the book of Job, chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, is talking about a dinosaur-like creature. What are your views on that? Yeah, well, you know, as an old earth creationist, I, I don't think uh, uh, dinosaurs ever coexisted with human beings. I think dinosaurs were created by God, uh, and, and I see God's handiwork in the in the creation of dinosaurs, and I think they they disappeared well before human beings ever appeared on the scene. Uh, when it comes to that particular passage in Job, uh, that's part of a, a larger section of Scripture where God is interrogating Job. You know, where Job has the temerity to question God, and then God's rejoinder to Job is to question Job, and what. God is doing is going through, in a sense, uh, the, the the work that He performed as Creator, bringing the earth and 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 life into existence. And so, it's in and of itself, it is a creation account that actually corresponds in remarkable ways to Genesis one. That's a fun exercise to look for that correspondence. That particular portion uh, there, I don't see that as actually referring to dinosaurs. Uh, but rather, I see it as either referring to uh, either some kind of metaphorical creature or most likely a high, highly poetic description of other creatures that evoke terror in human beings, like crocodiles and, 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 and hippo, like a hippopotamus. Those are uh, animals that I've seen others actually suggest that may be being referred to that are then dressed up in kind of poetic metaphorical language. You have to keep in mind that Job is a poetic book. And so there is use of, you know, poetic construction in Job as well as, you know, again, a lot of metaphor. And so the way I read that passage is that, that, you know, God is saying to Job that, you know, you stand before the creatures that I've created with terror and these creatures that I created that, that terrorize you might as well have these these type of metaphorical properties that they they would evoke this kind of terror in you, you know, as as if it, this creature breathed fire, or as if this creature had a tail that was the size of a log, right? It, it's kind of a again a poetic description of the terror that is evoked in humans in in light of the creatures that God made. So that that would be how I would view that passage. And and I'm not this is not unique to me, by the way. This is how other biblical scholars have have argued that passage should be understood. Right. So the next question is, it took God to create the universe in seven days. Now, the Bible says that one day equals a thousand years. Is it possible that God created the world by the Big Bang Theory? Uh, yeah, that's essentially the, the what I would be arguing and in, in is impl was implied, I think, uh, in, in the presentation. That, you know, if indeed the universe had a beginning, uh, and, and, and that everything that existed came into existence at once, or if God, you know, God speaks the universe into existence, well, what would it look like scientifically? It would look like the universe had a beginning. So I don't see the Big Bang Theory in, as an opposition to the Christian faith, but actually I see it, uh, it affirming, you know, Genesis 1-1. And the fact that we see, again, design in the universe, design in planet Earth, is all compatible with the fact that the history of the universe, even though it may be 14 billion years old, is inexorably pointing to ultimately the advent of humanity. You know, the the for example, the, the the fact that we have elements that are available to us 
to support life requires nearly 10 billion years of uh, of history in the universe where those elements are formed through stellar burning, which is a highly fine-tuned, very precise and exacting process that look like, looks like it's design. That was Fred Hoyle's whole point, uh, you know, is that the, the, the generation of the elements. But in order to have the elements that we need for life, you have to have stellar burning, creating stars, the ash of stars that then is used to then create the next generation of stars. And that stellar burning again, leads to the buildup of additional elements. There needs to be supernova events and things like that. So we live at the just right time. Uh, well, at four and a half billion years ago, that was the just right time where for the first instance, we had the chemical elements that would make life possible uh, in, our, in our locale in the universe. So the timing for you know, the, the creation of the earth coincides with the time where those elements for life uh, would be in the right abundance for life to be possible. Right. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, pretty soon we'll be moving to the second part of the Q&A. So any questions that you want to be answered right now, now is the time to upward them and make them uh, sit at the top of the ladder. So the next question is, what would be a good response to the puddle analogy, which is an atheistic counter to the fine tuning of the universe? Yeah, and in, you know the idea behind the, the puddle analogy is that you know the, the puddle will assume whatever shape the hole is, and in it and, it, and the puddle could marvel. Well, you know, look, isn't that the the shape of the hole exactly what it needs to be for for me to exist? And I think that the counter that 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 analogy is uh, kind of related to one interpretation of the anthropic principle, which is called the weak anthropic principle, which basically says, of course, the universe must be this way, because if it was any different, there wouldn't be observers present to recognize that the universe wasn't fine tuned for life. Of course, it has to be this way. But I would actually argue that it's not that um, that the, the puddle has a particular shape and that life just simply adopts to it. That I think the whole point of the anthropic principle is that you couldn't have life whatsoever if the universe was any different. It's not that you could have different life that would then conform to the law, the, the constants of physics that were in that universe. It's that life wouldn't be possible because much of what's done in the anthropic principle is essentially looking at the impact that changes in the laws of physics have on star formation, the types of stars that form it has on stellar burning. And that has direct bearing on the types of chemical elements that would be available for life. And I can tell you that as a, a biochemist, the only elements that are going to be capable of supporting life are going to be carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and phos phosphorus, and sulfur, and hydrogen. And those actually turn out to be the, those very elements that are in the highest abundance in the universe apart from hydrogen and helium. The, the carbon, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and, and phosphorus, and sulfur have an abundance that is the highest of any other element in the universe. And those are exactly the elements you need for life. You could not have life if you did not have a element, an element that has the properties of carbon. It's highly, a highly unique, highly unusual chemical element that, that allows the formation of compounds that have the complexity that you need for life to be possible. No other chemical element could do that. So if you had a different universe with different laws of physics, it's, it's really incumbent upon the skeptic to explain how that, that universe could generate uh, chemical elements that would have the properties that could support life. So I don't think that puddle analogy works at all. Right. And so the next question is, how can we biologically make a case for two gender view? Oh, how can we biologically make a case for, for a two-gender view? Yeah, um, that's a great question and a very pertinent question for the time that we live in when people are, uh, I wouldn't, are struggling with the issue of gender identity. And, um, you know, I think what Scripture is teaching, of course, is kind of a binary view, that there is male and that there is female. And uh, I think what I take from that is that that is essentially the way God designed it. But when you look at people that struggle, struggle with gender identity, and, 
And though I'm a life scientist, I've not spent a lot of time re looking into the biology of gender. So I'm just going to give you kind of my perception of this that, you know, but I would really encourage you to, to think critically about what I'm going to say, because this is not an area that I've devoted a lot of time to study. There are people, you know, that, that uh, for example, there are um, what are called XY females. And th there's a pretty significant number of women who are phenotypic, phenotypically women, but are genetically males. Uh, and and, I, and I, would, I would not call this a genetic disorder. That seems to me to be a very harsh way to describe somebody that's an XY female. But rather, I would say that this is, these are situations where the normative biology of gender has somehow gone awry. And as a result of that, people very well may be confused, genuinely confused for you know, biological reasons, or maybe for psychological reasons as to what their gender is, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the normative binary view is incorrect or biologically undermined by that, but rather it's saying that what is, what's normative can sometimes go awry because of just the sheer complexity of the developmental process. And so it would be analogous to say that um, somebody born without uh, one of their limbs uh, somehow undermines the idea that human beings typically have, you know, two arms and two legs. Uh, it doesn't mean that that individual has any less value or worth, right, as an individual, but it doesn't mean that that person now somehow reflects normative human biology, but rather something has gone wrong. So to me, I think, you know, I have enormous amount of compassion for people that struggle with gender identity because, uh, you know, it, this is, a, again, a complex, our, our, how we perceive ourselves in terms of our gender is complex, where, which reflects our, you know, our genetics. It reflects uh, what's happened to us developmentally from the point of conception to birth. It, 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 it is impacted by psychological, uh, you know, things that happen to us. And so I don't think people who struggle with these issues are doing it necessarily out of some kind of willful uh, disobedience to God's plan, I think it's a genuine struggle they have. And I think our response as Christians should be one of deep compassion, re reminding them that they are made in God's image, uh, that they are uh, somebody who God deeply loves, who sent his son to the cross to die for, and that God accepts them as they are uh, when when we come when com we come to God, God accepts us as we are, and we all are broken people who are flawed, who have profound wounds, who have profound needs, uh, and and God loves us as we are. And our response to people should be to love them as they are, to remind them they have infinite worth and value. Uh, and, and I don't think that again, people that struggle with these issues are some in, in the biology. And our biological understanding of this somehow undermines, I think, the, the teaching of Scripture that, again, the, the normative state is that there are two genders. Is there any peer-reviewed journal on creation hypothesis? And why does Christian scientists use the word creation theory instead of creation hypothesis when atheists use the words evolution theory? Yeah, um, well, the, the, again, a, a great question. Um, you know, there, um, I'm not quite sure how to approach this. Um, you know, at, at uh, Reasons to Believe, we have developed what we call a creation model approach uh, to, to scientific apologetics. And the idea behind that approach is, you know, we, we look at what scripture teaches about God's work as creator. And then we, from that, try to uh, develop kind of a coherent overarching interpretation of God's creative work from the biblical passages. And then we recast that, those ideas in the form of a, what would be called a descriptive historical model that then has predictions that can be used to evaluate the model. And we're, our approach in doing this is not necessarily to, um, to, to present a scientific alternative to materialistic or naturalistic models, but rather it's really used as a device to engage people uh, and interact with people 
about the scientific case for a creator. So we see that it's really an apologetics tool, an evangelistic tool. Uh, you know, but if there is going to be, I think, any kind of real inroads for intelligent design or for kind of a, a teleological approach uh, to, um, to science, which would be the first step towards introducing a, a bona fide creation model that would be a scientific model, it first has to come through, I think, convincing people in the scientific community that, that there is a teleology that is evident in, in biology. And so some things that I've been doing towards that end is uh, looking at how do uh, SETI researchers and archaeologists actually detect evidence for agency in nature and then applying their methodology to build a case for a creator trying to show that design detection can be a bona fide part of science. Uh, there's uh, uh, a journal article that I've just written uh, that will be pub hopefully be published uh, about how work in prebiotic chemistry is actually pointing to the necessity of agency to explain the origin of life, kind of introducing teleology. I've got a book that it, that's going to be a, more of a technical book uh, called Fit for a Purpose that uh, will be published in October that shows how when we look at the nature of biochemistry, it suggests a teleology that undergirds life. So these are some attempts on our part to try to Put, to push against the, the framework of methodological naturalism, which I talked about, you know, where again, what's constraining science is this idea that you can only appeal to materialistic, natural process, mechanistic explanations. So until you show that that framework uh, is either insufficient or uh, needs to be essentially relaxed in light of scientific observations, it's going to be very hard to have a, a true bona fide scientific theory of creation, though I think it is actually possible to do that very thing. And, and again, we've done that at Reasons to Believe, and we continue to work along those veins. But, it, but it's not to say that, again, stuff that appears, for example, in our work uh, isn't in, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. So, for example, uh, one of the chapters from the book I wrote, Origins of Life, I collaborated with Hugh Ross on that book, an astronomer, uh, on the, uh, critiquing evolutionary models for origins of cell membranes. I worked with another chemist and we took that chapter and we produced it into an academic journal article that was published in an original life journal. Uh, so, you know, there, so there are scientific, there's scientific credibility to the things that we're presenting, but, you know, this idea of, of trying to get a true scientific theory of creation is a very, very long-term project. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, to me, I think the, the ultimate objective should be to really try to show people that science points to the reality of a creator. Uh, and, and that, to me, is the priority that I have in my work, more so than trying to, uh, trying to uh, uh, revolutionize the way science is done. Right. And the, uh, the next question asks, how do we explain the evidence for Homo sapien ancestors like uh, the Homo Neanderthals, Homo erectus, etc.? Yeah, well, you know, again, if you hold to a, uh, a, a view of theistic evolution or evolutionary creation, you would say that these are transitional intermediates that are document, documenting the evolutionary rise of humanity. Uh, if you are somebody like me who's an old earth creationist, you would say, well, you know, clearly these creatures existed and they had some intelligence and some, again, limited uh, emotional capacity, uh, but that we, we would see them as creations that God made that existed, that disappeared, that don't necessarily have an evolutionary connection to humanity. And that we would argue that there are, uh, though biological similarities, there's also very significant biological distinctives as well. And there's also very important behavioral distinctives, which reflect the absence of God's image uh, and, and the presence of God's image in uh, modern humans. If so, so just as a quick example, uh, even though people oftentimes will claim that Neanderthals had advanced cognitive abilities like humans, those claims are not necessarily well supported when you look at the totality of the archaeological evidence 
Uh, what seems to be clear is Neanderthals were cognitively inferior to humans, and it's unlikely that they had language. It doesn't mean that they couldn't communicate. They just didn't have uh, an open-ended language like humans have. And, and so, for example, we see that the brain structure of modern humans is very different than the brain structure of Neanderthals, where the Neanderthal brain structure has an underdeveloped parietal lobe. And this is really significant because the parietal lobe is part of the brain that's necessary for processing math and language uh, and, and would be necessary for artistic expression and, and things like that. So that would be one example. Um, uh, uh, Ian Tattersall, who's an archeo I'm sorry, anthropologist, has argued that Neanderthals probably didn't have language. And his primary argument is the, the, the growth of in, in the trajectory of human technological advance. You know, humanity appears, let's say, 150,000 years ago on Earth. And in that time, we go from this archaic primitive technology to being able to put people on the moon. Uh, with Neanderthals, they were on Earth longer than humans were, and th their, um, their technology remained static. Uh, and so he argues that there's got to be a difference that accounts for that difference in trajectory of technology and growth of technology. And he argues that it had to be the capacity for open-ended language. And so I would see that as being a really significant delimiter. So yes, these creatures existed, and I would see them as being part of God's creation. There's biological similarities that reflect shared design, but there's also some very real significant differences that I think um, uh, allow us to view them really as not in the same category as human beings. Right. Remarkable and, creatures. Right, right. And uh, the next question is, I think it's going to be right up your sleeve because you've talked about humans 2.0 and transhumanism. It asks, what are your views on consciousness? Atheists hold on to the view that science will eventually explain consciousness in a naturalistic worldview. How do we show them that the theist position is more rational and reasonable? Yeah, wow, that, that, is, that is a really important question. And I think, you know, the origin of consciousness is something that, that, that a materialistic, naturalistic worldview really struggles with. Uh, because we don't even know exactly what consciousness is, how to define it. Uh, yet we intuitively recognize uh, and understand something to be conscious or, you know, or, or lack consciousness. But yet we can't really define it or characterize it. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, this is an area that I've simply not put a lot of effort into, so I can't really give a, 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 an authoritative answer to this question, uh, you know, because unfortunately, when you get into certain areas of, of apologetics, you kind of have to focus. Uh, and I ch have chosen to focus in kind of the molecular areas uh, and, and in the life science areas. The, the person that I would strongly recommend if you want to delve deeper into this topic of, of consciousness and why the Christian worldview holds the best explanation for consciousness is really reflecting kind of an immaterial nature to humanity where the mind is different from the brain and that there's, a again, an immaterial aspect to our nature would be J.P. Moreland. Uh, and he, he's got this wonderful book called The Soul, which is uh, an accessible discussion of you know, uh, of the whole issue of, of, of consciousness and the mind brain problem, that would be a great place to go. What's also interesting is a book by Thomas Nagel, and I'm drawing a blank on the, the name of the book right now. That happens as you start getting old, you can't remember names. But Nagel has a, a great book where he argues that very point from the standpoint of a, a materialist, of, a, of a, somebody who is an, an atheist who argues that consciousness cannot be explained in an evolutionary framework and um you know uh in is you know really troubled by that you know by that fact you know and and he ap appeals to this idea of panpsychism where consciousness is kind of a property of the universe if you will uh which is a kind of a really odd uh view but it's kind of like saying well matter and energy are kind of given they're fundamental to the universe could we think of consciousness as being fundamental to the universe? I've seen other scientists do the same thing with life, where they say, look, we can't define life. We don't know how life originates. We're just going to take life as a, as a, as, as a, as a fundamental given to the universe. 
Um, you know, so it's kind of a, a, a sidestepping the real significant concerns that arise out of not having a materialistic explanation for consciousness or for life. So I would read Nagel for uh, an atheistic perspective, and then J.P. Moreland would be a great place to start. Right, and the next question, um, we're about the last couple of minutes. The next question asks, if God created humans in his own image, why does genetic mutations happen naturally for some individuals, which makes them recipients of rare genetic diseases and disabilities? Can sin be blamed for such mutations? Yeah, you know, that's a... <laughs> That's a, a, a great question because, um, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, bearing on the problem of evil, which is, you know, the, the oftentimes the rejoinder to the design argument that if God designed this world, then why is there pain and suffering that's caused by, you know, natural phenomena that God has, has instituted? And to me, you know, I don't necessarily see... Um, genetic mutations as a result of, of sin in a fallen world. My view of the fall is that what changed was humanity and our relationship to God, our relationship to others, and our relationship to the creation. Uh, so I see humanity changing and our relationship to the world that God created changing. I don't see the world changing as a result of the fall. So I don't blame genetic mutations and the origin of human diseases on the, the fall itself. Although I do think there is a sin component that contributes to the to genetic mutations, I see genetic mutations as essentially a out a trade off of the fact that we have a universe that conforms to the laws of thermodynamics, uh, and if it wasn't for the first and second law of thermodynamics, life simply wouldn't be possible. And this even includes entropy. Entropy is necessary for for life to exist, and I see entropy as part of the elegant design of the universe. Uh, uh, but as a consequence of living in a universe that conforms to the laws of thermodynamics, there are going to be certain trade-offs that happen. Certain, and, and part of those trade-offs will be that mutations take place. But it, what's interesting to me is that in the midst of these mutations that do take place, uh, there are all these repair mechanisms that, that are part of biochemical systems that are incredibly elegant that actually compensate and offset many of the it, many of the, 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 the consequences of mutations, essentially correcting those errors as soon as they happen. The problem is, is that, again, you're confronted with another trade-off. And that is that if those repair mechanisms corrected every one of the genetic mutations that took place, they could, they could very well do that. It would essentially bog down biochemistry to such a point that life simply would not be possible. So mutations are an inevitability of the fact that we live in a, in a universe that conforms to the laws of, of nature. And, uh, and the, those laws of nature must indeed be fixed, you know, uh, it, because if they're not fixed, then uh, you, you wind up in a universe that cannot be a moral universe. In other words, the laws of nature must be fixed. They must be invariant in order for, their, for anybody to be morally accountable in the universe, because it means that the universe is predictable. And if the universe is predictable, then you can be held accountable for your actions. And then you can say certain actions are right, certain actions are wrong because of the consequences of those actions, right? So you can't have a moral universe if the laws of nature are varying or unchanging. But as soon as you have fixed laws in nature, you're going to have trade-offs. It's inevitable. It's just the way it works. Uh, and, what, and it doesn't matter what those laws in nature are, they're going to be trade-offs. So if we lived in a universe where there are different laws of thermodynamics, we would still have other features of nature that would still we would still view as being problematic because of the of, of trade-offs. So to me, what's important is that in the midst of those trade-offs is that there are these, again, uh, compensation, com compensatory mechanisms that buffer the, the harmful effects of, in this case, mutations uh, that mitigate those trade-offs. Uh, but it also says to me that there very well may be a, a higher purpose that God has for the pain and suffering that human beings suffer from. And I think, you know, Christian theologians and philosophers have addressed this issue. Part of it is that, uh, you know, the, 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 this pain and suffering can serve a higher good. 
it, it can there's the, the soul making theodicy where you know the, the pain and suffering we experience leads to growth in, in, in character development uh, that there is an ultimate purpose behind the pain and suffering that is it's preparing us to enter into the new creation uh, in a time where there will be different laws of physics in which the, the pain and suffering that we experience in this realm is going to not exist anymore. Uh, so that so you could argue that there's maybe a reason why God allows pain and suffering in this world. Also, it's not not only is it what is our individual response to the pain and suffering we experience, but what is the response to the pain and suffering we see others experience? And this is an opportunity for us now to be people of compassion. And 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 God, through His providence, has provided us within the creation these incredible resources that can be used to mitigate human pain and suffering. It's now up to us to be motivated to to dig into the creation and to extract that insight and that understanding and to develop the medical technology to try to correct the the, the pain and suffering that is caused. This is where CRISPR gene editing comes into play. This can be viewed as a gift from God that reflects God's providential care for humanity. And I think part of the issue here where sin comes in is because our relationship with other people is damaged because of our sin, because of our relationship with the creation has been damaged from sin, many times the, the compassion that we need to have for other people is missing. The Our ability to extract insight from nature is hindered because of our sin. And then many times we do damage to the environment, which again is against our mandate to be caretakers of the of the, of the planet. And that damage to the environment leads to environmental pollutants that then trigger genetic mutations that cause the genetic disorders and cancer. And so we have a, a, because of our sinful nature, we probably are exacerbating the effects of natural processes where there's a strong moral component to the, to the pain and suffering caused by genetic mutations. So it's a complex topic to be certain. And I've kind of touched on a number of points very clear or very quickly. I don't know how clear I've been, but um, but it's a great question. And it's something that I continue to wrestle with, you know, as a Christian apologist. And it's a question that keeps people from the Christian faith. And so I think it's important that we are wrestling with these questions in an open and honest way. Uh, and um, uh, in the process you know, the greatest apologetic many times we can have is how we live our life and, and, and our willingness to love other people and to serve other people in a, in a genuine way. Uh, because when atheists see Christians doing that, they have enormous amount of respect for Christians when they see them doing that and they have respect and they value the Christian faith. And that, you know, it's important to be able to give intellectual answers but how we live our life is also very important. And so apologetics should never be done apart from um, living a, a life of service as a Christian. Absolutely. Well, uh, we have come to the conclusion of today's amazing session. Uh, I want to ask everyone just to hold on. We're, just, we're going to wrap up today's session in the next three minutes. Uh, first, thank you so much for that thought-provoking, very insightful, very informative talk, and also for engaging with these varied uh, questions that have come in and uh, before we wrap up first is there any a, a concluding word that you would like to share with the attendees uh, of Eriopagus 2021 day two yeah I think you know that uh, to me we live in a world that is strongly influenced by science and technology people increasingly are turning to science and technology for their hope for their salvation and so it's very important that we are speaking the language of the world that we live in today and it's worth investing the effort, I think, in understanding how science can be used to build a bridge to the gospel and recognize that this is not an easy undertaking. You know, it, 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 it takes time. Recognize that, you know, in the process, you will have failure. You will have points where, you know, you, you, maybe that interaction didn't go well, but learn from it and, and, and then, you know, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and jump in and engage again. Uh, there's, you know, uh, uh, we're called to, to be faithful, not to be successful. And God will use our best efforts uh, if we are operating in a sincere and loving way. And ultimately, I think, 
you know, it's so easy in apologetics to get into debates and to begin to view people that we're debating as being the enemy. We always have to think of them as the mission field and that we should never enter into a conversation with another non-believer and utilize apologetics if first we haven't come to the point in our heart where we truly love that other person and we truly respect that other person.